the best way to learn a language, immersion, living where the language is spoken and using it every day. But if that's not in the cards for you this year, you can still learn a language the second best way, and that's with Babbel. Be a better you in 2024 with Babbel, the science-backed language learning app that actually works. Don't pay hundreds of dollars for private tutors or waste hours on apps that don't really help you speak the language. Babbel's quick 10-minute lessons are handcrafted by over 200 language experts to help you start speaking a new language in as little as three weeks. Babbel's designed by real people for real conversations. Babbel's tips and tools are approachable, accessible, rooted in real-life situations, and delivered with conversation-based teaching so you're ready to practice what you've learned in the real world. For instance, I've been using Babbel's convenient courses to help me learn basic conversational skills in German while I'm getting ready for a little trip I'm planning. It's not a language I'd ever studied before, but I find the lessons really easy and kind of like hand-holding me through learning a completely new language to me. And it's reassuring to know that with the help of Babbel, I'll be able to greet people, order food, and ask for directions without having to consult language apps. While I'm in Deutschland, I'm still learning. Studies from Yale, Michigan State University, and others continue to prove Babbel is better. One study found that using Babbel for 15 hours is equivalent to a full semester at college. Babbel has over 16 million subscriptions sold. Plus, all of Babbel's 14 award-winning language courses are backed by their 20-day money-back guarantee. Here's a special limited-time deal for our listeners. Right now, get up to 60% off your Babbel subscription, but only for our listeners, at babbel.com slash vulgar. Get up to 60% off at babbel.com slash vulgar, spelled B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash vulgar. Rules and restrictions may apply. Do you know what lies within nothing? No. Do you know where it ends? Do you want to know? Yes. <laughs> Counterbalance, a high fantasy audio drama. Season 2, coming 15th of October 2023. Learn more on trilunas.com. Hello and welcome to Vulgar History, a feminist women's history comedy podcast. Today, I'm so delighted to share this interview that I had with Vanessa Riley, who if you aren't familiar with her work, like you're about to be, and you should be, her books are so good. I was really thrilled to be able to to chat with her about her new book, Queen of Exiles. So it is the story of Queen Marie Louise Coivadad Christophe, who was, she was the queen of Haiti and she lived in a period of time that I often think of as just like the Regency era, like the early 1800s. And this book talks about the history of Haiti. It talks about what was going on in Europe at the time. This book goes to Italy. It goes to England. But at its core, it's really the story of Queen Marie Louise. And we talk in this interview that you're about to hear a lot about who the real life person was. Vanessa also talks a lot about how she came to write this book, the research she did, like it included some European travels, which sounds so lovely. And Vanessa, just so you know, she was the 2023 Georgia Author of the Year Award winner for her previous historical fiction book, Sister Mother Warrior. She's written so many books, um, all historical fiction, some romance novels, some murder mysteries, some like this book, straight up fiction, all so good. And I'm really excited for you to hear this interview with Vanessa Riley about Queen of Exiles. Hi. So I'm joined today by Vanessa Riley, whose new book is called Queen of Exiles. And I'm so excited to talk to you about this book and to talk to you about the main character who is a real historical figure. I have so many questions for you. But first, I just want to say welcome, Vanessa. Well, Anne, thank you for having me. And I just can't wait to talk about Queen of Exiles. There's a couple of things I want to talk about just to sort of ground everybody in the story and the history, because... To understand who she is and the significance of her life, we need to talk a bit about the history of Haiti. So can you sort of set the scene of the world that she was born into? So uh, when Marie-Louise Covidad is born, we'll just call her Louise, she is in a blended family. She is the daughter of a hotelier owner. So 
Her father, a free black man, owned this very exquisite hotel in Santa Domingue, which is the, the capital during that time frame. So you get a lot of Westerners coming in. They called it the Pearl of the Antilles. So that she was very used to that lifestyle uh, because her father had to cater to them. And so his daughters understood that lifestyle. But, you know, Senator Bing is a tale of two or three different factions. You have the, the Grand Blancs, which are the, the wealthiest, the wealthy. You have the Petite Blancs who want to be Grand Blancs. Then you have free coloreds who are mixed race children of Blancs and enslaved people who are now free. Then you have uh, just this wave of uh, enslaved Blacks. So you have a Franchi that could also be free Blacks, but you have also this underbelly of society of enslavement. And everyone but the Grand Blancs is unhappy. Everybody wants more freedom. Everybody wants the ability to move up socioeconomic classes. And this constraint of, I will steal you from the continent of Africa and force you in these camps, and I won't care about the condition you're living in. And how the life expectancy is just cut short for these people. So there's a lot of pain and whatnot. But you have this almost idyllic life in the same place. She is the hotelier's daughter. Well, a free man comes to the inn one day. His name is Henri Christophe. He's fought in the American Revolution. He has ambitions to join the growing rebellions. But he instantly falls in love with this, this young girl Family keeps them apart for like two years, <laughs> but they end up getting married. And now she's a soldier's wife and the rebellion uh, explodes. All factions of Haiti is is burning. And finally, Jean-Jacques Dessalines commands the forces. He is able to push France away. Henri Christophe is his second in command and Haiti is now free. She is now the, you know, being the wife of the general who's the second in command is, you know, a lot of authority. I, I've read about the par- dinner parties and whatnot that she would hold at her house. But Henri Christophe is an ambitious man and there's discontent because Desalines has now appointed himself as emperor because he's trying to best Napoleon during this time frame. It's a time of crisis and there is discontent because those free coloreds are upset that the Black generals have all the power. The free coloreds have more education. The ones who excelled in combat are with the free Blacks. So there's this this thing between Haiti where you have coloreds and free Blacks, and they're fighting, they can't get along. uh, Jean-Jacques Dessalines is, is assassinated, and the country splits into two. So the Republic is in the South, the free coloreds are running that, the Black generals they are running the, the kingdom in the north, and it eventually becomes a kingdom. Christophe becomes its first king, and his wife is the first queen. And so I gave you probably too long of an explanation. No, no, no. <laughs> it's necessary. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a, a part of history that I knew very little about going into this book. And I mean, I do want to let all the listeners know, like in the book, like you explain this step by step. So everybody knows what you need to know. But just in terms of this conversation and this podcast for people who haven't read the book yet, like the history of Haiti, it's so interesting. It's so, I didn't know any of these details until I read the book. So we've got this woman who met this guy at her family hotel. And now suddenly she's the queen of Haiti. Can you talk about what that era was like for her being the queen, like he built a palace, Sans Souci, and they're hosting balls. It's this elegant, glamorous time. I've written her as a reluctant queen because she was content being a soldier's wife. Then she had to become content being a general's wife. Then she had to become content being the president's wife. And now he's he's wants her to be a queen because Christophe believes that France is going to come back. His overarching thing is France is going to come back. And if Haiti does not have friends in Europe, in America, that will always be the way France is going to come back and no one will stop them. So he decides that I look at the English court, I look at the Prussian court, I look at the Italian court. Everybody understands these peerages. We're going to create that in Haiti. So we're going to have, I will be the king, you will be the queen, we'll uh, create dukes or comptes and and, um, dussels. We'll have the, we will match the European aristocracy. 
Because if they see us as their peers, they will see us as human, and then they will understand why we need to be free and never under France's yoke. In doing so, you know, women for the revolution were a huge part. The African identity was a huge part. And so there is a battle now. You, the, what got us to be free? Women acting, women carrying the battle cries, the way of African battle movement and tracking. And now you want women to go back to just being pretty faces in, in beautiful gowns. And you want to divorce yourself from this African identity to accept this European identity because you believe that is the way. And Louise, the practical woman, is trying to balance because she does see he is right. We need to have friends in the outside world. But at the same time, we cannot forget who we are. We cannot forget our identity. And so there's a there's a battle that goes on. And, and the funny thing is their kingdom is set exactly to the Regency. So everybody is, is familiar with the Regency times and, the, and the, that's the world they're trying to fit in, having this kingdom. It, it's, it is a struggle. And there are successes in the kingdom that you find out. Like, you know, it blew my mind that they had immunizations. It, you know, they, they had uh, the, you could literally go into schools and these children who once were picking in the fields, the sugar cane, are now learning French and English in the classrooms because he understood these, our people have to be educated. We've got to be able to match the peers of the world. He was bringing in scientists from, uh, from America, from all over Europe. Uh, and it, it, just a lavishness. I mean, he's buying things from the best furniture makers in Germany. Also, you know, the Milners in uh, in, in London. I mean, he, the jewels. It's it's all of his things because he's he's mimicking European society and the things that he believes that they value. And so when they come to visit, they will see it. They will identify with it, and then we can all fit in, and and um, we will have support in the world. So it's, it's a fraught experience. And as a woman who understands the needs of that, but also understands where the people are and how far his vision is so far ahead of where they need to be and that, that the problems, she's trying to right the ship, but it's, it's sometimes it's just a bigger task than, than you are able to do. And then can you explain where you're, you're describing all the things he was purchasing, how all the things that he was doing to make everything look similar to, to England and other royal courts like that. Where's the money coming from? It's sugar exports, right? Yes. When uh, Desilene's is emperor, he begins to rebuild the economy because, you know, war has, has trashed the economy, the, the, the burnings of the, the buildings, like every, the burning of the fields. So uh, people are, are given land and they have to farm this land and they give a portion of this land to the, to the government. So they give a fortune to, to Henri. Well, Henri is selling this to the world. So when the money comes in, there's fees, there's transfer fees. That's going into his pocket, into his collection. And the rest goes into Haiti. And so there's literally, there's, there's points where they have to, his ministers come to him and be like, okay, but, hey man, uh, we're going to have to split this up so that everybody knows what's, what is the country's, what is yours. Um, but at one point, he actually has more cash on hand than the king of England. They are wealthy in property and lands and jewels, but you're talking about cold, hard cash. <laughs> Henri actually has more because the, the lust for sugar did not stop with Haiti becoming free. It is still the, the, the drug of choice of all over the world. And the imports are uh, within, I forget the metrics, but within a couple of years, they were exporting a great deal of sugar uh, to the world. And I really wanted to understand where the money was coming from, because that becomes such a major plot point. And it's funny talking to you about this book, you know, people listening who haven't read the book yet. The book is not told in chronological order. You're kind of, you see some of this, the time period you're talking about when Henri is so ambitious and she's being the queen. And then you're also seeing earlier and you're also seeing later. But so I, I think we can jump around her life a bit and it's not going to spoil the book yeah. for people, but she ends up in Europe, basically. And there's a question of how is she going to support herself? And it turns out that there is a substantial amount of money she's able to have, right? Yes, yes. And that was, it was, it was interesting rebuilding all of that because there's, to me, it was always a disconnect. When people talk about Louise, they, I always hear poor and sorrowful, always attached to her name. And she came to my attention 
one, because of the research I'd done uh, for my previous book, but they were putting a plaque on a, on a house in Mayfair saying that Marie uh, Louise lived here. Mayfair is one of the most expensive parts of London. And then another house in Hastings on the seacoast. I actually was able to walk in this house and look at the view from her, her living room. It is amazing. These are expensive cottages. Now, am I to believe that the goodness and mercy of the English society is going to take a poor, exiled Black woman and put her up in all of these wonderful, exquisite, luxurious locations? Or is it make more sense that she actually has access to money? And when you look at that financing, Henri has banks that he's dealing with in, all, in, in America. He has banks that he's dealing with in, in London. When he dies unex, uh, unexpectedly, they're still holding on to a large portions of, the, of that money. That, in my opinion, that's what she draws on. She utilizes, she retains the same people. They are able to make settlements with all of these banks. And that is what she has to live on because they do extensive travel all across Europe. Uh, the properties that she owned or leased are, are, are immaculate. You cannot do that if you have no access to money. So she was able to rebuild. She didn't have it at first because, uh, you know, we, we, we see her living in hotels. We see her living on the kindness of some of the abolitionists that were working with the kingdom uh, at first. But then when she comes into her own, uh, it's, it's significant and she's able to live well and she's able to make sure her daughters who came with her are are, are have the princess experience, so to speak, that they are treated like royals, which they were. This is all, and you mentioned, you know, it's happening over the the nineteenth century. So starting off in kind of the what we think of, what I think of is like Regency England. You know, when I think about that time period, that's the most famous country at that time. And then getting later into the nineteenth century, and she's you have in your book, you include, and I think you say there are actual news clippings of of stories about things. She was so well known and so famous at the time, like as just this wealthy queen in exile traveling around Europe. Like she, it blows my mind. I've never heard of her before. I didn't know any of this, right? This completely blew my mind. And at one point I was suckered into this. Okay, well, maybe she had some money, but you know, maybe she wasn't accepted in society. And then I start doing this research and I find these news clippings. And she was very well received in society. Marriage proposals, you know, you have your your fortune hunter chasings as well, and people pretending at different points that they are related so that they could get part of this money that she has. So the fact that people know she has money and they're curious, what is this woman doing? What is? How does she appear? Where is she going? Um, you know, the the best example of how far she climbed and how far she was held in status was there was this huge opera opening. And I think, I believe it was David Copperfield is, is cataloging this for his, his, his memoirs or his travel memoirs or whatnot. And he talks about the King of Prussia being seated in the front row and the King of Westphalia seated in the front row. And then you have Madame Christophe and her daughters. And then you have the Prince of Prussia front row front section, not hiding in the corner and sitting next to literally enemies of her, her husband, because these are the brothers of Napoleon sitting in that front row with her and her daughters. So it's, that's the level she could, you know, money, I believe in history has always trumped race. So all of our expectations that we get post, you know, Victorian uh, sanctification and, and ripping away of, of different legacies, this is not there. This is before all of this. This is where everything is. And and so the newspapers literally tell you the story that she everywhere she went, people are following her, taking, you know, not necessarily taking pictures, but they are recording what she's doing, where she's going, who she's meeting with. Her papers were bought uh, during the, I think the first world war, maybe in the second, but her papers were bombed and destroyed. I would have loved to get my hands to get a deeper dive into what she was thinking was going on because she saw, you know, all of her enemies die. They all died in, in Haiti or, the, or when they went abroad. Everybody that came against her, she's literally, in my opinion, a living legacy of the achievement of that society. And she lived her life as a queen. And, and I think we do such a disservice 
where we rationalize in our heads what we think has happened in history, as opposed to what has actually happened in history. When you were discovering these newspaper articles and other, like that detail you just gave about her sitting front row, I mean, what what were you think like, because you went into this, I would imagine not knowing any of these details, and then just detail after detail explaining that she was this, she was literally a queen. She was a queen like any other queen. She was traveling around. She was getting, a, you know, she's wealthy. She was respected. Like, what was it like to discover these details? It blew my mind uh, because I had bought into, uh, you know, it, it still stopped making sense, right? I had bought into the lie that... This Black woman is there with her daughter. She's poor. She's ostracized from society. And I wasn't looking for a story of sadness. I wanted to see, I, so I was desperate to find some hope, something to show that, you know, that though there is suffering in her life, that is not her life. And then we go into it and use newspaper after newspaper talking about her jewels, talking about her going here, going to uh, different uh, spas. I mean, it's just, it is enormous how well documented Queen Louise is and her travels in Europe. And yet none of that remains in our, our present psyche. We go back to poor, sorrowful because the kingdom fell. She was part of that kingdom. That is not that woman. This woman is so much more than the kingdom. And in my opinion, Everything that Henri wanted to achieve, this, this, this acceptance, she got it when she was in Europe. She was a queen, recognized as a queen. So, you know, it's, it's to me, we do a disservice when we don't look at the facts, when we just assume based on systemic racism that this is the way this woman is going to be treated. We make all these assumptions and we are literally putting her in a box that she was never in. She overcame. And I'm not saying her life was easy by any stretch of the imagination. A, a lesser woman might have been broken and whatnot. She kept her dignity and she marched through life with her head up, not down. So she was. she had joy in the midst of sorrows. She found victory where people wanted her to be defeated. She's a woman we need to know. Absolutely. And that's that's part of just reading this book. And then I love that you put in the newspaper articles because that really is like, this is true. This is real. Like, this is what happened. Because I kept reading this and I was like, how can this, how could this be true? And I've never heard anything about any of this. And what you just explained is. And, and that's why I love the fact that they let me put the newspaper clippings in because you got to see it because, you know, sometimes with historical fiction, you don't know what's true, what's not, you know, where, where is the author's imagination? I mean, it is fiction, right? Because I wasn't privy to these conversations there. You do do an approximation of like, if the, if I'm living in the sphere, I'm in the palace, these are the possible conversations I'm going to have. But when you see in black and white, these newspaper articles, I mean, it's, it's truth is stranger than fiction. And I was like, I'm going to have to put this in just so y'all will understand this is true. Yeah. This is real. This is happening. No, exactly. And that's that was exactly what I, my experience when I was reading it. I was just thinking, I'm like, okay, I, there's a part in the book where she, there, there's another suitor who comes on the scene. And I was like, okay, well, I, you know, Vanessa's probably imagining this. She's probably making this plot. Like, no, no. In the newspapers, it's like these two people are seen together. Like there were rumors that he had proposed to her. I'm like, oh, okay. No, that's... <laughs> <laughs> That's also drawn from history. Prince Buckler is another guy who's famous because uh, for being a writer. But before that, he was he was uh, he was looking for a rich wife. He was looking for rich wife number two. But he never actually marries again after meeting Louise. So there's a change that happens. He still loves women because they're 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 women before and after Louise. He loves women. But that whole motivation to find a rich wife to marry changes after he meets her. So it's it's there's something there's something special there. And I think also her full healing from the tragedies of of what happened with Henri, et cetera. And just she's still a woman, even though she's a queen. This is 
honestly, like talk, even talking to you right now, I'm just like, I can't believe that this is a real person from history and no one's ever really written about her before. And now we're just going to take a break for a word from our sponsors. As a podcast network, our first priority has always been audio and the stories we're able to share with you. But at Realm, we also sell some pretty cool merch and organizing that was made both possible and easy with Shopify. When you think about successful businesses like Allo or Allbirds or Skims, an often overlooked secret is the business behind the business that makes selling and for shoppers buying simple. For millions of businesses, that business is Shopify. That's because nobody does selling better than Shopify. It's the home of the number one checkout on the planet. And the not-so-secret secret that's definitely worth talking about is that ShopPay boosts conversions up to 50%. That's more happy customers and way more sales going... If you're hoping to grow your business, your commerce platform better be ready to sell wherever your customers are scrolling or strolling, on the web, in your store, in their feed, and everywhere in between. Businesses that sell more, sell on Shopify. Upgrade your business and get the same checkout we use with Shopify. Sign up for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash realm, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash realm to upgrade your selling today shopify.com slash realm. Ah, the web tour. Those that both creators and were created by the threads disentangle from the fringes to feast on the very thing that spawned them. What's that, Siri? This is how you deal with me! No! <laughs> not for my children! Oh, you lost a feather. Can I keep it? No, you can't force me to. Do you know what lies within nothing? Rocket is in trouble, Akasa. Can can we turn on the windshield remotely? No, she could lose her job as Nakasar. I don't fear Vehar, no. But you fear me. If you intend to trick me, I will not hesitate to sever the oath bond entirely. Why didn't you help me? Coward! I don't have a parachute! Free Counterbalance, a high fantasy audio drama. Season 2, coming 15th of October 2023. Learn more on trilunas.com. People often look at me with confusion when I ask them what their only one in the room story is. They think it has to be like mine, where I went to a 600 person event and discovered that I was the only black person there. I know, horrifying, right? Hi, I'm Laura Cathcart Robbins, and I'm the host and creator of the podcast, Only One in the Room. Every week, my co-host Scott Slaughter and I invite you to join us for an hour and lose yourself in someone's only one story. This podcast is for anyone who's ever felt alone in a room full of people, which is to say that this podcast is for everyone. And we're back. Originally, I started to buy in until things, the math was not mathing. And I'm like, something is wrong here. And so I, I expanded my search. And particularly because I originally I was trying to find more meetings within the British aristocracy. But when I started looking at the whole of Europe, because she travels, so what? that's where you find all these other very interesting connections and meetings and the 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 life that she lived. It's she was very European in the, her travels, in where she lived. And so with Queen of Exiles, I wanted to give you a taste of all of this that this woman has done that we should really know about. That's the other disservice. We, we've done a disservice to ourselves by not knowing about this woman um, or even looking at Haiti in today's lens as this, as this society that's of, of struggle as opposed to what it was and what it could have been if countries had stepped up and done the right thing and and kept France from coming back. In your, I think it's in the the postscript, like at the, the epilogue of the book, you mentioned just briefly, and we don't need to get into it a lot, but you said you do a, a comparison to Bridgerton, you know, the, the thought of having Black people at these elegant balls, you know, having these titles and stuff. And you say like, that's what was happening in Haiti. And I was... Like that comparison just really sat with me because, you know, there's been all these discussions about Bridgerton and with Queen Charlotte and stuff. And just what does it mean to that show, which presents a fantasy world, a fantasy version of England where black people are in the aristocracy. And you're saying 
well, in Haiti, that was what was happening. <laughs> exactly. Um, I love Bridgerton because there's something magical about seeing this diverse cast and seeing love is love uh, on the big screen, right? There's, it's incredibly magical. Uh, it's escapism and the, the fabrics and the beauty. and But that's fantasy. They take bits of truth and, and like some of the, you know, like the fashions aren't even, you know, if you were you'd be a stickler, the fashions aren't exactly <laughs> Regency-esque uh, or, you know, but that's not why we go to Bridget. We go for pure enjoyment. We want to watch the story evolve. We want to root for our people. But when we look at history, there are people to root for. There are stories to be told. And Haiti is a special place. And what they had for the exact same uh, nine years as the Regency from 1811 to 1820 was magical. Uh, they achieved such heights. Uh, this was a society of promise and all the lovely intrigue and court life that you love in Bridgerton, it was happening over here in Haiti. So with the, with the same levels of opulence and, and the crazies and the balls and they were bringing opera troops. I mean, it was just when you read it and you realize the culture aspect that was happening it just blows your mind. It, to me, I was I I constantly was like mouth open, and I'm like nobody's gonna believe this. That, you know, <laughs> and so you know, I, like I said, I, I I that's one of the reasons I highly document things. I'm like y'all don't believe me. You go look at the bibliography. You look at the there's a newspaper. Clip. Make of it what you will, but. I don't know how we do it, but somehow we're going to have to evolve where the facts matter. And we can't just write things off or close our minds to things because we assume it's it would have to be this way. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly on the acceptance of a, of a royal woman coming from the Haitian court. You know, one of my favorite antidotes was Prince Saunders, who was an American, went to England and actually had breakfast with the Prince Regent because his name was Prince. He didn't realize, Prince Regent and his people didn't realize that Prince Saunders, Prince was his first name <laughs> and not an honorific. And so, but once again, if you come and you have titles and you have money, you are accepted into the fold. Now, it doesn't mean you're exempt from scandal or, 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 or they're looking for scandal. You know, they're waiting for you to do something. But it doesn't mean you're not exempt from scandal. But there's a level of acceptance that money has bought. So this is a thing that I don't think people really realize and then the whole history of Haiti, it was amazing. And to me, it always asked that question, what if? What if they'd gotten a little more support? Because Henri had actually achieved that. Russia and England had stepped in and forestole uh, France from coming back uh, in 1818 and 1819, but then he dies in 1820. And five years after he dies, France comes back demanding repayment um, for the losses of the war. I don't know if you know the musical Camelot, but, or even just the concept of Camelot, you know, there's that song that they sing in that it's like for one brief shining moment, there was this amazing thing. And that's the way you're describing Haiti and the way it's in the book. It's just like, it was, you know, and that's another thing I appreciate about the way you wrote the book, which is not in chronological order. So in the scenes that are set during that sort of glory time, when the kingdom was thriving, like you're sitting there in that moment and there's not a sense of, you're right there, it's live, it's it's happening. You're not thinking like, oh, it was just a short period of time. Oh, you know, things got bad afterwards. It's You can sit there and be like, this is basically, it felt to me similar to reading about Regency England. You know, it's just <laughs> princes and princesses and like, you know, who's going to marry who and all this courtly intrigue. It's not the people in it didn't know it was going to end so soon. So they were just living like this was going to go on forever. Exactly. As one would, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because the, you know, the, 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 the sugar money is still coming in. Uh, it's still funding this lifestyle. Um, and they are, are getting on with it, their lives. So, you know, they're still rebuilding pieces of Haiti because of the, you know, the years of war. They have these moments of, of very high culture, 
that to me is exciting and it's in his discovery that I wanted to share and, and bring you in. And, and you're right. I wrote it so you don't feel that dread that this is, only, you know, looking at the clock. Oh, only five more years. Oh, only three more. Years. No, I wanted you to you to be there and to see the problems that they had within the kingdom. And then when you jump back, you see the problems outside of the kingdom. And I did want to also mention, so two other important characters in the book are her two daughters who leave Haiti with her, who are with her in exile. Can you just talk about them, their stories and how you learned about them and which details you included in the book? So she has two daughters who flee with her. The younger daughter is of a sickly nature. She's very curious about the world, uh, very supportive of her mom. The older daughter was, I would say, the the beautiful one in in Haiti. She was getting the acclaim um, within her father's construct. She's the princess royal. And now you come to England and you want to have that social life. And this is before they, they're able to really reclaim their money. Um, and so they're only put in the little boxes here. But it, the world begins to slowly, as the money starts being recovered, beginning to expand and you know they're going to parties and balls and they're wearing these expensive gowns and whatnot and they're fitting in or so they think they're fitting in uh in England because you know they're these are very old peerages peerages older than your peerage that begins to be a play and then that whole identity of what is beauty you know what is be- what is the standard of beauty you know the, in that particular time frame a healthy Blonde girl is a is is the is the ultimate. It wasn't even these little skinny things that we see right around nowadays. Healthy girl, because you can bear some babies. That was the standard of beauty. Black is not on the scale. It's not that people didn't find black beautiful. There's always been an appetite for black bodies, but this is something that's being wrestled with. And so, how as a mother, how do you give the world to your kids? How do you give society? How do you, and then when she gets rejected because of who she is, how do you deal with it? And then there's always that, you know, like the Moses looking back with people like, we we had bread back in in Egypt. (laughs) Maybe we should go back because people thought I was beautiful and I fit in back in my Haitian world. And it's like, go back to what? They're killing anybody associated with us. And if you marry somebody with political intentions, your husband and your children will also be at risk because they're they're fearful that the Christoph line will run will reign again. There is no future for you in Haiti, not as it is. How do you deal with that? And so when they finally begin to travel, the world opens up more than when they were in England. And in the European stage, because now they have their full access to the money and they can go to the various places. It is back to peerages matter more than race uh, and standards, uh, beauty. People see beauty in people at this point. And so that is showcased in these daughters. But at the same time, how does a mother who's dealt with tragedy, knowing that her youngest daughter is sickly and that one day she may not be able to breathe. She may not wake up. How do you give her enough of this new life so that you feel like you've you've done everything for her too? It's a trick. It's another balance. She's back to being in a balancing act. How do I show the proper amount of attention to each daughter? I love both of my daughters, but because of their needs, they, they take different parts of me. They require different amounts of time. How do I balance that? While at the same time, I know the world is looking in, waiting for me to stumble. And I thought it was so interesting, too, the way that you describe, because the two girls, they grew up during this time of affluence in Haiti. So they grew up as princesses. And then to suddenly, so just, which is such a different childhood from what their mother lived. So she's Mm -hmm. trying to understand their understanding of the world. It was, it's just a really interesting balance. But again, and I think you mentioned this a couple of times in the book, there's some parts where the main character herself is thinking about, you know, what does it mean to to be black and to be royal and to present a role model to these girls who don't have anyone else to look at, look up to who is that? And what does that mean? And there's a part in the book where I forget the name of it, but it's a book that was written in that time period about. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. By, by Claire, 
I don't remember the name either. Or, Ulrika. Or I, I'm, I'm afraid. Yes, yes, yeah. Yurika, yeah. Uh, or I'm afraid of mispronouncing it. I'm very Southern in my pronunciation. So yeah, that is a, that's a true book. And the connection um, is the Viscount uh, who, who befriends uh, Madame Christophe. And that book to me is like one of the most horrible books, but it's, what's the nice way to put this? These are the kind of books that have been acceptable in publication for a long time kind of like, the, I call it the pain porn quantity, right? So you give enough Black tragedy and Black pain, and that's a that's a winner right there because it, it just gets to the audience and people get to feel sorry about things they didn't do and, and just <laughs> generate. And it's like written by someone who doesn't understand the beauty of Black skin, who doesn't understand the journey or the walk when you are Black, trying to write a Black person and coming up with, it must be sorrowful. Uh, it must be, you don't want to be Black. You want to be anything other than Black. And then the descriptions of this book about a devil and, and all the different stereotypes that have been characterized throughout the years of a Black existence. You fight it in this book, and this book becomes like a number one seller in France. It's it's horrible. But to me, it's, it's just another um, another flashpoint of showing what they have to what they have to do to exist to go back to even Henri's perspective of we have to show the world this so that they know this is what blacks can achieve so they know that they can be comfortable around us because we're just like everybody else and you get this book published in that same time frame and they would have access to it to me I, I had to put it in because it's it's a capstone it's it's a it's a it's a stake in the ground of this is what the world potentially could be thinking of you and your daughters and why we think you're going to fail and why I can't fail as Queen Louise. I have to make sure I succeed. I have to make sure my daughters succeed so that we don't become Eureka. Yeah. I Just the moment where, it, I forget, it's one of the daughters, but they had been raised as princesses, you know, surrounded in a place with Black nobles and aristocracy. And then she reads this book and she's like, oh my God, this is she didn't realize that that's how she is seen by other people. And it's this sort of major moment for her. But then you also say in your, in your afterword of the book, and you mentioned it earlier in the interview as well, you didn't want to write a book about tragedy and pain. You wanted to find a story of hope. So I thought that that was an interesting parallel that in the book, <laughs> it's a way that you can mention in the book, you know, that the, this is both your characters feel this way and you obviously feel this way. Why do Black stories always have to be? stories of grief and misery and pain. And why can't it be a story of triumph and hope? And that's what this book is. And that's what this is. You've written so many books, all of them historical, I think. <laughs> and that's very much what you're doing, right? In all of your books. Exactly. See, so they, shh, they, no one's figured that out yet. <laughs> 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 the little rebel Vanessa. Uh, but yeah, I. there is so much to the existence that is more than just pain. There are moments of joy. Even, even if you are suffering, you're in a bad situation, you can still find moments in the day to smile. Certain things will make you happy. You hang on to joy much more fiercely when you know sorrow. And I see that's what these people did. You know, Queen Louise, she lost a lot and then had to leave her homeland in order to make sure that her daughters were safe and that they could have a safe future. That is a that is a great burden to put on someone. But I cannot see how you can go to every spa city in Europe and be unhappy. I'm like, come on now. <laughs> so they found moments of joy. I'm convinced of that. They found moments of joy. The fact that they they still took to the opera, because if they stewed in their depression or really were consumed with how much we lost as opposed to what we have. They wouldn't go to opera. They wouldn't be concerned about what they wore. They wouldn't go to these various places and follow the royal tours like they did if they were worried about all of the pain that they had suffered. They were trying to make their futures. They were trying to move forward. And to me, that is what this book should show, how they moved forward. It's like, again, like for me, my experience reading this book was absolutely that. It's that sense of just sort of very a strong woman who faces all these challenges, but she's got this indomitable spirit about her. So she just keeps going 
forward. But part of me reading the book was also just like, how did I not know any of this? How have I never heard of her? <laughs> so it's it's both. It's both. Yeah. You know, I, unfortunately, sometimes these gems are hidden and the, the pain stories are the ones that get the that we all know. Um, you know, I was one of those kids that was glued to the TV when Roots came on. Roots is a very important story, but it's not the only story. But it seems like since that was successful, that told everybody in the world, oh, these are the kind of stories that everybody wants to see. We want to see some of those stories because it's important to remember, but we also want to see the heroes and the uh, revolutionists. We want to see the people who just dis- made discoveries, the inventors, the business people, the politicians, people who changed the world. We want to see that too. And we want to see people who fell in love and, and had nice lives, you know, that weren't always characterized by suffering and misery. We want to see the whole, a full gambit perspective. Everybody is owed a full gambit of identity. We're everything. We can be warriors. We can be martyrs. We can be lovers. We can be on the picket lines. We can, we can be everything. Everybody's owed a, a full humanity. And sometimes that has been lacking. When I think also, again, like the fact that you put the newspaper headings, again, which is a detail I love, but to really confirm for people who are reading this, like this is a real person. This is how she moved through the world. This is how she was seen. Because a flip side of this is sort of when people do start putting Black people back into historical films, there's that pushback being like, oh, that's not accurate. Oh, there wasn't whatever. There wasn't Black people in ancient Egypt. There wasn't Black people in the Roman Empire or whatever, where it's like, what are you talking about? But so a book like this, like it proves like, you know, (laughs) black people weren't only enslaved for all of history, you know, like here's evidence. And I love that your book is like, here's every single chapter starts with like proof, 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 like you're not making this up. So it just, hopefully it can open people's minds when they see other stories, you know, that are not just all white people to show that. Exactly. I, I, I know I'm breaking ground in a lot of, in these stories. And so I go to the nth degree of the full on, you know, dissertation in the back of the book, plus bibliography and whatnot. And, and this was a new level of putting the, the actual newspaper clippings uh, in the story. Y- y- writers shouldn't have to go to that to tell these stories, shouldn't have to go to those links. I don't mind going to it because I know it's going to add to the enjoyment and discovery of, for my readers. But that shouldn't have to be the level that mm-hmm. someone needs to to do in order to make sure everybody understands this is a true st- this is really based on a true story this really happened to this woman and her daughters and her family but you know hopefully you guys will go out and you'll get this book and you'll read it and you'll tell your friends about it and you'll tell more friends because when these types of books come into the mainstream it opens the door for more books it makes the job of historical fiction writers easier. It makes everything more accessible. And everybody's story gets gets to get told. That's what I really hope for this. Like you're seeing you're breaking new ground. You have this, and like listeners, like the bibliography, there's pages and pages and pages. Like you've got, as though it is an academic nonfiction book, like you've got all of your facts straight. But hopefully, exactly, like as the, as figures like this become more known, then more people can write about them in different ways. And the next person who writes about her won't have to prove as much because maybe the story will be better. More people will know it a bit already. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Or even some of these new new figures. You know, there's, there's so many people who need their stories told, who need to be brought back into our consciousness. And if this can open more doors, because we need the whole story. We need everybody and everyone's story is important. So we need all of it. And, you know, we shouldn't be afraid of letting these stories be told. So this episode is coming out just at the same week that your book is being published. So can you tell people, I assume you're going to be doing events, you're going to be, where can people keep up with where they can find you and, and that sort of thing? My website, vanessariley.com has all the events listed If you're on social media, my Instagram, my link tree has all the events linked. So you can go because we've we've got some fabulous events from from everything from launch at at Foxtails 
uh, and all of the venues you can you can order books. You I will sign them, personalize them for you, and they ship. Everybody does everything all over the country, so it's it's going to be great. But yeah, VanessaRiley.com or my Instagram. I have the most up to date of what's going on. Follow me there. It's going to be fun. I'm, and I should get my newsletter. I I, t- I might have even more tea. Yeah, in the newsletter. Fabulous. I love I love that there's a way. I yeah. I love that just in this era, there's a really way for readers to connect with authors and see what they're up to and and to follow you. And I'm I'm going to be in Columbus. I'm going to be in New York. I'm going to be in Aiken, South Carolina. I'm going to be all over Atlanta. So there's 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 number of, of venues to catch me or order books. Uh, it's going to be great. But check my website out. That's the mothership of all. Perfect. Well, thank you so, so much for taking the time to talk to me today. It was sometimes when I read a book, I'm just so thankful I have this podcast. So I have a reason that I can talk to the author and ask questions and learn more, but also just let you know how much I enjoyed the book and how much I appreciate what you do. So thank you. Oh, thank you. And thank you for having me and have me back. I'll I'll probably have more books. (laughs) (laughs) So again, the book is Queen of Exiles by Vanessa Riley. It's available everywhere, everywhere. I can't recommend it enough. It's such an interesting book. And I love what she's doing with these historical fiction novels, these recent ones. So her previous two in this kind of, not a series, but this sort of similar thing. There's Island Queen, Sister Mother Warrior are looking at lesser known. I mean, frankly, at this point, kind of unknown Black women from history and re-examining their stories and just turning them into these lovely novels. She's also written some murder mysteries like Murder in Westminster, Murder in Drury Lane. She's written romance novels like A Duke, The Lady, and A Baby. There's so many things. Anyway, you can find out all about her books and Queen of Exiles and where she's going to be appearing as this book launches at her website, which is VanessaRiley.com. And this is Vulgar History. You can keep up with this show. We're on Instagram at Vulgar History Pod and on TikTok at Vulgar History. You can get early ad-free access to all episodes on if you join the Patreon, which is patreon.com slash Anne Foster Writer. And you can get transcripts for recent episodes um, by Aveline Malik of The Wardery at vulgarhistory.com. So thank you so much for listening. I'll talk to you all next time. And until then, keep your pants on and your tits out. Vulgar History is hosted, written, and researched by Anne Foster and edited by Christina Lumagi. Welcome to the small town of Chinook, where faith runs deep and secrets run deeper. In this new thriller, religion and crime collide when a gruesome murder rocks the isolated Montana community. Everyone is quick to point their fingers at a drug-addicted teenager, but local deputy Ruth Vogel isn't convinced. She suspects connections to a powerful religious group. Enter federal agent V.B. Loro, who has been investigating a local church for possible criminal activity. The pair form an unlikely partnership to catch the killer, unearthing secrets that leave Ruth torn between her duty to the law, her religious convictions, and her very own family. But something more sinister than murder is afoot, and someone is watching Ruth. Chinook, starring Kelly Marie Tran and Sanaa Lathan. Listen to Chinook wherever you get your podcasts. Contained herein, are the heresies of Radolf Buntwein, erstwhile monk-turned-traveling medical investigator. Join me as I study the secrets of the divine plagues and uncover the blasphemous truth that ours is not a loving God and we are not its favored children. The Heresies of Radolf Buntwein, wherever podcasts are available.